Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Sparks online sermon. I'm Lori Stevens, the church administrator, and we're glad you're here. Pastor said in 50 years of preaching, this is the first time that he really didn't want to preach a 4th of July message. What's happening in America has grieved his heart. So this morning, he is basically going to give us the state of America and why it's in the condition it's in. So you might want to get your popcorn and enjoy this fiery, uplifting, patriotic sermon. And as always, share these videos with your family and friends, like and subscribe. Good morning. This is the first 4th of July in my memory in which I really didn't want to preach. What is going on in America grieves my heart. When I see the weakness in our president, that he can hardly speak or walk, and then when he does say, and what he does say and do is so opposite of what the Bible teaches and what our Christian faith believes and our founding fathers anticipated, it's not only discouraging, but downright depressing. But what it has done, for me at least, is drive me to Christ, the Bible, the Word of God for hope and help, and it does pick me up. We have to go back and remember what God did for Israel and has and can do for America, and that is make America great again. Remember, it was our God who sent Israel the plagues to deliver His people from bondage of Pharaoh who led them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night for 40 years. It was Almighty God who split the Red Sea and the Jordan so His people could cross on dry land and escape Pharaoh and defeat their enemies in Canaan. This God who is our God fed Israel for 40 years with manna from heaven until they crossed over into Canaan. This God, our God, gave His people victory after victory over their enemies. Obviously, we weren't around when that happened, but we can read about all those things that God did in those days. In other words, David in Psalms was telling the nation of Israel that they had become the greatest nation that had ever existed on the face of the earth. Not because of anything they had done, but because Almighty God made them a great nation. Without a doubt, when you compare the nation of Israel to all the nations that ever existed, it stands out head and shoulders above all the rest up until America. And just as God watched over and took care of Israel for thousands of years, He has taken care of us since July 4th, 1776. And God has blessed this country. No other nation in the world other than Israel can make the claim our great nation can make about how God mirac miraculously created us and took care of us. But today it does seem God has taken His hand off America and has allowed morons and nitwits to lead us. What Isaiah says in chapter 3, verse 4, is a commentary on America when Israel turned its back on God. He said, I will give them Israel children to be their leaders, and babies shall rule over them. That's America today. I'm not sure who is all to blame, but somehow we have put ourselves into a place that God is displeased with, and He has given half our country over to a reprobate mind. He's blinded half our people. And these are the ones in charge, making the laws, setting the example. It's pathetic to say the least. Surveys show Americans are a religious people, but the gods and idols they worship are not biblical. It's not the God of the Bible. I do believe the majority of Americans have created a false god in their minds, and they worship that false god. Dr. James Kennedy was pastor of the famous Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida. He said that a friend once was reading to a lady out of the Bible about God, and how God would, what He would do with the guilty, she responded by saying, Oh, my God would never do that. He replied, Ma'am, you are right. Your God would never do that. The problem is that your God doesn't exist except in your mind. That is what I see in America today on just about every subject. People disagreeing with the God of the Bible on everything. No eternal hell, abortion, homosexuality women's place in the family, women pastors spanking children, open borders, coddling criminals, no death penalty, racism, sexism, and on and on and on. They make what they believe their own God. 
And that makes what they believe their idol. How else do you explain what's going on? For me, it's hard to make sense of what is going on in America this 4th of July. I could mention many things going wrong in our country. But instead, I want to recall some of the things that have made her great and that have allowed God to bless us. There are two verses of Scripture that I think are very important for us, not only to hear but to remember. The first one is Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts or lifts up a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. And the second is Psalm 33, 12. Blessed, happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people He chose for His inheritance or His possession. As Christians, you are chosen by Him and are His possession. The New Testament says that we are bought with a price, and that price is the blood of Christ. Twenty years ago or so, by a two-to-one vote, a three-judge panel of the Knight U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance in public schools was unconstitutional. They ruled that the phrase, One Nation Under God, in the pledge was an endorsement of religion, and thus violated what those two judges stated was the constitutional mandate of a wall of separation between church and state. Now listen, those words and that thought are and is a flat-out lie. There's nothing in the Constitution that says there is to be a mandated wall of separation between religion and the state. It was interesting to witness the reactions throughout our nation to their ruling. I've never seen the vast majority of Americans so united against a judicial ruling as it was against that one. President Bush was the first to speak out. He called it ridiculous. Not to be outdone, a number of senators called for a vote on it. And whenever the Senate votes 99 to nothing about anything, it's time to take notice. Then the House of Representatives also voted unanimously to condemn the ruling. To top it all off, Judge Alfred Goodwin, one of the two judges who issued the ruling, decided to order a stay on its implementation, which meant that it would it would stay the same until a court ruled otherwise. All this uproar started because a California atheist claimed that his daughter was being traumatized by hearing her classmates say the word God in her presence. Then it was discovered that the daughter wasn't bothered by the word at all. In fact, her mother said she and her daughter regularly attended church. Also that her daughter readily joined in with other students in saying one nation under God when reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. My point is, with all that is going on today, God can turn it all around and make these insane happenings a blessing. But it takes God to do it. And I think He might have to do it without the majority of Americans. Remember when the brothers of Joseph, after the death of their father, were afraid that Joseph would take revenge on them for the terrible things they had done to him when he was a young man. They begged for his forgiveness, and the Bible says in Genesis 50, 18, that they came and threw themselves down before him. They said, we are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. Did you hear that? You intended it for evil, but God used it for good. That is what gives me a ray of hope in what is happening in America this morning. That God is going to turn all this evil around. And He's going to do it without us. Here are some things that happened as a result of that California ruling. For example, when that ruling was made known, we saw on television almost all the senators and representatives rushing to the Capitol steps in order to be seen reciting the Pledge of Allegiance including saying the words, One Nation Under God. This morning, or the next morning, instead of the usual empty chamber for, for the opening prayer, with television cameras running, almost every seat was full. For one day at least, they wanted the voters to see that they were here, and uh, listening to the chapel, calling upon God for our nation and for our nation's leaders. That was just 22 years ago. And so that is a reminder to all of us how far and how fast we have fallen in a very short time. But today a whole lot has changed for the worse. 
that wouldn't even cause a blip today. There are so many horrible things and examples, I'm not going to even go there. But now the media and one political party not only deliberately ignores Christians and Christian values, but are in a brutal attack against us. It's obvious that we have come a long way from the faith and heritage of our founding fathers. They were the ones who proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence that our rights come from God, that men are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The basic framework of our country grew out of this concept of God-given rights. But take God out of it and we are left with a nation whose freedom stem from nothing more than the whims of those in power, a concept the framers of our Constitution absolutely rejected. Back in the early 1960s, the U.S. Supreme Court removed both prayer and the Bible from public schools. And then in 1966, Time Magazine declared that God was dead. And that was just the beginning. Thomas Sowell, a great Christian intellectual conservative, wrote, In a nation where the vast majority of citizens profess their belief in God, our courts have ruled that there is no place for His word, His praise, or His glory in any public place from the schoolroom to the city park. We continue to hear today the often repeated statement that our Constitution mandates a wall of separation between church and state. Let me quote what three high judges in our land have written on this subject. One wrote, Much has been written in recent years about a wall of separation between the church and state. This statement has received so much attention that one would almost think that at times that, is to be, that it is to be found somewhere in our Constitution. But it isn't in it. It does teach freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Those words aren't anywhere found in the Constitution. Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart wrote, I think that the court's task is not responsibly aided by the uncritical invocation of metaphors like the wall of separation, a phrase nowhere to be found in our Constitution. And when he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Rehnquist wrote, but the greatest injury of the wall notion is its mischievous diversion of judges from the actual intentions of the drafters of the Bill of Rights. The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor used on bad history, a metaphor which has proved useless as a guide to judging. It should be frankly, explicitly abandoned. So the next time you hear anyone say that our Constitution mandates a wall of separation between church and state, realize that they are just parroting an often heard but absolutely false statement. It's a big lie. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's Ministry of Propaganda, said, If you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, you can make people believe anything. And that is what's happening in our country today. And here's what also is happening today. Nazi Goebbels said, accuse the other side of that which you are guilty. Isn't that exactly what's happening in our current politics today? And what is happening to that phrase, wall of separation between church and state? Look at our verses again. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. In Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people he chose for his possession. Considering these verses, I could go in two different directions. I could mention many more of the things gone wrong in our country and why God should bring his judgment on America. Or I could recall some of the things America did that have made her great, that have allowed God to call down his blessings upon us. I ask, why would God bless America? I answer, because we have been a good nation. We have tried to do what is right. We had, we've tried to follow the teachings of Christ. First, I do think God has blessed America because we are a generous people. To my knowledge, the United States has never been a selfish nation. From the beginning, our Christian foundation has led us to care about others and to help others in countries around the world. Jesus told Matthew in 22:39, Love your neighbors as yourself. 
The Apostle Paul told us in Romans, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Over 50 years ago, back in 1973, Gordon Sinclair, a Canadian television commentator, delivered this editorial on his TV program. And it created a lot of comment. It was even put into the congressional record. Let me read part of it to you. Remember, this time frame was from Watergate in 1972 until the resignation of President Nixon in 1974. It was a tough two years for America, and much of the world was looking at this uh, great nation with glee as we were going through our problems. Sinclair said, This Canadian thinks it's time to speak up for the Americans as the most generous and possibly the least appreciated people on all the earth. Germany, Japan, and to a lesser extent Britain and Italy were lifted out of the debris of war by the Americans who poured in billions of dollars and forgave other billions in debts. None of these countries is today paying even the interest on its remaining debts to the United States. When the franc was in danger of collapsing in 1956, it was the Americans who propped it up, and their reward was to be insulted and swindled on the streets of Paris. I was there. I saw it. He said, when distant cities are hit by earthquakes, it is the United States that hurries in to help. This spring, 59 American communities were flattened by tornadoes. Nobody helped them. He said, the Marshall Plan and the Truman Policy pumped billions of dollars into discouraged countries. Now today, newspapers in those countries are writing about the decadent, warmongering Americans. When the railways of France, Germany, and in India were breaking down through age, it was the Americans who rebuilt them. But when the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central went broke, nobody loaned them even an old caboose. Gordon Sinclair said, I can name you 5,000 times when the Americans raced to help other people in trouble, but can't even think of one time when someone raced to help Americans in trouble. This Canadian said, our American neighbors have faced it all alone. And I'm one Canadian who is tired of hearing them get kicked around. They will come out of this thing with their flag high. And when they do, they are entitled to thumb their nose at the lands that are gloating over their present troubles. I hope Canada is not one of those. So first, God has blessed America because we have been good and kind to others. Second, God has blessed America because right makes might in God's eyes. Terrorists live by the opposite principle. They think that if they have bombs and are willing to die to use them, that they can terrify their enemy into submission. They think their might makes them right. But America has always believed just the opposite. Right makes might. As an example, think of this small struggling nation in the 1700s. We were a nation of farmers. We didn't have the factories of Britain. We depended on her for our supplies, and we depended on Britain's army and navy for our protection. So when it came to the American Revolution, we had none of the things to win except we had right on our side. And remember, right makes might with Almighty God. Back in the beginning, in our little log cabin schools, children received a basic education in reading, writing, and arithmetic. And most importantly, they learned what was right from the Word of God. Every student in America could recite the Ten Commandments. Because our founding fathers believed they were right, they waged war. The 13 colonies had few weapons and limited resources. They faced the largest army and navy in the world and the largest empire in history, the British Army, and they defeated them. Out of that conflict, our founding fathers produced the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States that gave the greatest amount of freedom to the greatest number of people. And the United States grew to give the greatest good to all mankind. Why? Because they believed right makes might in the sight of God. Look at all the wars the United States has fought and Compare them to the wars of other nations. I think of the empires that have gone to war to gain territory and wealth. England, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, China, Japan, other nations. But the United States has refused to get rich off the wars she wins. Our nation even turns around to give to those we defeat. 
We helped build back the nations that attacked us. The American experience of freedom and liberty has been treated and tested in every century and almost every generation, from George Washington to Valley Forge to Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War to Ronald Reagan who challenged Russia, tear down this wall. I could mention many things going wrong in our country, but instead I have chosen to recall some of the things that have made her great, and hopefully God will remember and pour down His blessings on us. Amen. It seems to me there have always been challenges to American freedom. Today we are being challenged again, but this time the enemies of America are from within, and they are taking the freedoms given to them by our Constitution and preserved by the blood of our military, and they're using them to distort, tear down, and destroy us. And the only way we can win is for the God who founded us to come to our rescue. And to get God on our side, we must be on His side. And if we're on His side, then hopefully He will bless America again. Finally, and most importantly, I believe that God has blessed America because Christians in this country are trying to carry out the Great Commission. This might be the most important of all. When Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the church has taken that command seriously. From the very beginning, our colonies and the settlers sought to reach out to Indians and others with the gospel of Christ. Since World War II in particular, the United States Center for World Missions in Pasadena, California, reports that there have been more than 600,000 career missionaries who have been sent out to every part of the world. And what did these missionaries do? Obviously, they went to evangelize and win people to Christ. In the process, they established churches, missions, hospitals, orphanages, clinics, agricultural centers, schools, colleges, and seminaries all over the world. And many of them paid the ultimate price for their dedication to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They gave their lives. What I'm saying is God cares about souls. It would not surprise me if God is withholding final judgment on America because of churches like First Baptist Church of Sparks and Christians who are witnessing and sharing the gospel in their personal lives and in their worship services, in their support of missions at home and around the world, even purchasing Bibles for groups like the Gideons. I really believe that when churches and Christians lose the desire to win people to Christ, we basically are worthless. I mean, what good are we? We're our social club fighting for social justice. Now listen, the good diversity, equity, and inclusion all takes place in people's hearts when they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But DEI must take place within the teachings of morality and the standards of the Bible. With God, without God and morality, diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is one of the most vile teachings to ever crawl out of the pit of hell. In closing, if you are truly concerned about America, if you earnestly want God to bless her, then it's time for you to commit yourself to live a life in harmony with His will. And of course, that starts with accepting Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If you would like to become a Christian... In sincerity and truth, pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I ask Jesus to forgive me for all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. Hope to see you next Sunday with another sermon.